Hello everyone. In this lecture, we are going to talk about a, a very important aspect in some robotics, and it's about running our experiments. Run our, our experiments either in simulation and in, or in hardware or in both. We are going to talk about the different simulators that are available, what are the advantages about using simulators, and what are, of course, the disadvantages of using simulators. We are going to talk about running experiments with real hardware and what are the challenges and what are the benefits of it. So, but before going into detail, I would like to ask you a question and, and this question is going to be important for this lecture. Let's assume that we run our experiments in simulation and we get the results and we're happy with the results. And now we want to run the same experiments in hardware. The question is, are we going to get the same results that we saw in simulation in hardware as well? Spoilers. No. The results are going to change and they are going to be different. And that's what we refer in research as the reality gap. And we are going to talk about the reality gap in this lecture. Right. Simulators and reality gap. In the first third of the talk, we are going to about why robotic simulators are important and what kind of a characteristics we are looking for simulators. In the second third, we are going to talk about the road simulators that are available out there and that you can use. Some of them, we are going to mention some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages. In the last part, we are going to talk about the reality gap. A very briefly mentioned what the reality gap, but in this section we are going to define it into more detail and I'm going to show you some ways that you can decrease this reality gap. Robotic simulator. Right. Why to simulate robot swarms? It's very important to simulate robot swarms because it allows us to see the behaviors of robots using the algorithm that we just developed. And we can see it in a very quick way. You can run simulations in a very short time. This is very important because when you run experiments in hardware, this is not the case. Experiments in hardware, they take longer. And if you want to see results quickly, you can run many simulations and get the results fast. And even if you want to increase even more the speed, you can use like parallel computing where you can run many simulators at the same time and get the results quickly. Why we want simulations in a quick way? Well, in a future lecture, the, you're, they're going to mention about the importance of having a sample size and that we want to use many replicates to simulate. So we want to retrieve this data quickly. And this is why to simulate robot swarms is important, so we can see the behavior that we want in a short period of time. Again, this is just a summary of why is it important. Another aspect is about the cost of hardware. When we are testing our algorithm, sometimes our, our algorithm might not do what we want. And if we run it directly in hardware, there is a high risk that we are going to break the robots because the robots are doing weird behaviors. They might be crashing against each other. They might be doing something different. So in simulators, we can see this 
and prevent these issues so we can save cost in hardware. You can test the scalability. What do we mean by this? That you can add and remove robots and any given time easily. You can test your simulations with up to 1,000 robots without worrying if you have those 1,000 robots. As I said before, to test your algorithms and to find the appropriate values for the parameters of your robots. This can take a time in real hardware and it's very useful to do it in simulation. And one more thing, if you are developing a hardware platform, we mentioned the advantages and disadvantages of doing this before, but if you want to do it, this is really useful because a simulator can tell you what things you can add or remove from your robot. And finally, in, for example, in the research that I'm carrying on right now, we are intending, we are developing robots that we are going to send to nuclear plants. But nuclear plants is a very dangerous area to work on. So we can simulate these environments without putting ourselves at risk and the robots. And then when we're happy with the results that we got, we can send these robots to the, those Harsaros environments. Here are more reasons why it's important to simulate. And the first one is that a good thing about simulators is that you don't have to look what's going on on the simulator and to prevent any issues like breaking robots. You can let the simulators run in the background without worrying. Why is this important? Well, if you want to run experiments in hardware, you have to develop that platform and that's going to take time. So what you can do to save time is that you can run all your experiments and simulations in a cluster in your local PC and let them run. But at, at the meantime, you can start developing your robot platform. So you can be running experiments and developing your robot platform at the same time. So this can save a lot of time that you could use to analyze those experiments and run experiments with real hardware. As I was saying before, it's important for statistics. In statistics, you want a relatively large sample size. And the only way to get this is to run many simulations at the same time and this is and you can only do this with simulation because with hardware you will require a large number of robots to do this and the last one is that sometimes as i was saying in previous lectures the development of the robot platform can take a long time and sometimes you just need to test quickly your experiments and you want to get results quickly. So you run the simulations and this way you can get the results and you don't have to wait until the robot platform is finished to get the results. Because most of the time you're going to be in a time constraints. Right, but what makes a good simulator we saw we just discussed the, the importance of having a simulator but what kind of things we are looking for in a simulator well there are a few things it needs to meet the requirements of functional requirements to test our algorithm if we are gonna use a robot with a camera the model of that robot in the simulator should have a camera. But what about accuracy? What about if the sensor has noise or the wheels has noise in the real hardware? Is it important to have this in the simulator? The answer is mostly yes, 
but it will highly depend on the experiments that you are running. But yeah, what are we looking for a good simulator? Accuracy, as I was saying before, we want to have a, the most accurate possible representation of the environment and the robot itself. So when we finish running experiments in simulations and we put them in hardware, the two behaviors closely match. If it's not, if if the simulator is not accurate, there is a high chance that the behaviors they are not gonna match and the results we are gonna be different. Again, the reality gap. We want to be fast, so we can run many simulations at the same time. We want the simulator to be easy to use. And why is this important? It reminds, it's just it reminds me that I have met people that they start using a new simulator out of scratch. And the simulator doesn't have a good documentation. And the problem with this is that it's gonna take you a long time to understand how to use the simulator. And again, time is important. And we want to save that time that you spend learning, running experiments. So we want a simulator that is relatively easy to use. Many, many times when you want to run an experiment in simulation, you will find out that the simulator or the robot model that you are using doesn't have the features that you want to run your algorithm. So we want our simulator to be open to changes. Okay, let's have an example. Again, we want a robot with a camera. But what about the simulator doesn't have models of robots with cameras? We want to develop our own model with camera. So we want to have this freedom. What else? We want a way to develop controllers in a short time. This is important because we want, because of two reasons mainly. The first reason is that we want, as I was saying before, a way to straightforward to write code, in this case controllers, and we can deploy it in simulations and see results. But another important reason is that, and this is very particular in some robotics, is that when you are running experiments, if you have a homogeneous swarm, the controller is going to be the same for all the robots most of the time. And what we want is that when we write a controller for one robot, we want that controller to be the same for the rest of the swarm. So we want, we do. what we don't want is to be copy and pasting this controller over and over and over again. Cross platform. This is related with about the robot models that simulator particular has. For example, let's say that you want to run your experiments using the Epoch platform. But for some reason, the simulator doesn't have it. So what, what, what you want to do is to have this option to create your own model or search for another simulator that has the epoch. And the last one, and something important that I like to talk is about the general purpose and the bespoke simulators. And the general purpose simulators are good because you can implement them for a different range of applications. And But there are some disadvantages, of course, because if you want to run experiments with a very specific application, this might not be possible with a general purpose simulator. In this case, you're going to need a bespoke simulator, but usually 
these simulators they take long time to develop and when you finish this simulator you might not have time to run experiments so you have to be careful with this and also you use an already available bespoke simulator it might not have the good enough documentation and it might be challenging to use so yeah there are some advantages with general purpose and bespoke simulators right so we mentioned why simulators are important and what kind of things we are looking for for simulators let's mention a few of them that are available that we can use for robotics forms the first one is called play player in stage this was a very popular uh, simulator used back in the time it was firstly introduced in 2003 and it has a player robot abstraction. Usually the simulator, sorry, the simulator was divided into parts. The simulator itself and the robot models. That's why it's called player stage, where stage is a simulator and player is the robot model that you wanted to use. Like I was saying, this simulator was really used. Many people used it but there were many disadvantages and just to name a few about this one is that the documentation was not very good I met a colleague a long time ago who was using the simulator and the only way to use the simulator and do not spend time in reading the code and learning how to use it was to find another person who has used it and that person wrote a list of instructions about how to use it. So yeah, we work. This doesn't make player stage a good simulator because, as I was saying in the first part, we need a simulator with good documentation so we can use it straight, straight away without spending how time learning all this, all this stuff about the coding. Also, this simulator was not very well maintained what do i mean by this is that you could use this simulator in a, a specific operating system but if for any reason you upgraded your operating system this simulator is not gonna work anymore and you had to make quick fixes and patches and stuff to make it work which wasn't really nice and it was really dirty. And another thing is that it's a 2D simulator. It only works with two dimensions. But I guess this is okay because for most applications in some robotics, they are in two dimensions. So let's see now a video of a simulation. simulator Argos Argos has become really popular in some robotics and with a good reason Argos was first introduced in 2012 it was it, it came from a robotic lab in Brussels it's a very fast simulator it's a 2d simulator you can run many simulations at the same time in a short time it's very scalable as well. You can have many robots in a single simulation and it won't hold much your simulation. It might, it, it will do a little bit, but not compare anything with other simulators. The only problem, well, there are a few problems, is that it has a few robot models. In this case, one of the default ones is a football robot. 
we talked about this root robot in the previous lecture. And the epoch, someone else had to develop the epoch platform, but I think you can use it, so it's fine. And the main drawback about this simulator is that it's the low precision and accuracy. It means that the representation of the environment and the robots is not very accurate. And there are good things and bad things about this. The good things, as we just mentioned, it's quick. You can run many simulations at this because you don't need uh, high accuracy. But when you try to put uh, the, your algorithms in hardware, the performance might be different. And one last thing that I'd like to mention about this simulator is the documentation. The documentation is way better than player stage. It's not perfect by any means, but you can use it fairly easily. Right, VREP is the next simulator and it's becoming more and more popular used in some robotics but it, for other areas in robotics is really popular. It has a very high precision, the accuracy is really good and it's because of phys the physics engine that they're using. It allows you to modify many things, the friction, the weight of the objects, of course, this comes with expense that is computational expensive. And if you want to run simulations, they're going to be slower than Argos. And it's really good for small groups of robots. But as soon as that swarm starts to grow in size, the simulations start to become slower and slower and slower over time, which is not very good. But a very, very good thing about BREP is that the documentation and the user interface is it's great. It's one of the best that I have ever seen. It's very straightforward to use. It's well maintained. It's 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 really it's a good simulator. You just have to be careful with this. If you wanna have large group of robots, it might not be the best option. But apart of that, the documentation is great.
The next simulator is Gazebo. Gazebo is an independent project developing since 2011. And this project is faster than BREP, a bit slower than Argos, so it's somewhere in between. And again, it's more precise than Argos and less than BREP. And this project was an extension of Player and Stage. And this is a simulator that I have least experience with. Many people use it in evolutionary robotics, but not much in some robotics. From what I've been told, the documentation of this simulator is not as good as BREP, but there is some documentation that you can use. And the problem is that if you want to install new dependencies, it gets a little bit more difficult. Okay, so we just talked about the simulators that are available, but something that I'd like to question, to ask, sorry, is how to make a robot model. As we said before, most likely we want to run our, on the, our experiments in real hardware, but before that, we need to test our algorithms in simulation. So we need the, both the model, the simulation model, to match the robot model in hardware. So how do we make it? We are going to discuss that in this third section, the reality gap. The reality gap. The reality gap, as we were, as I was mentioning before, is the discrepancy or the difference between the results that you get from simulation and the results that you get from hardware. This is a classic figure where you have the IR sensor, which is a dashed line, and something interesting happens when you take the same measures in the real hardware. When you're using the motors, the readings change, and when you're not using the motors, the readings change. This is probably because, the, because of many reasons. The environment might be different, the, the robot is vibrating when the, the robot moves, the motors are introducing magnetic fields that can change the readings. But the important thing to visualize here is that the readings are different. How important is this difference? It, it will be highly dependent of the task that we're doing. So, how do we measure? How do, what kind of things are we looking when we are modeling IR sensors? Well, we want our model to, to be able to detect obstacles. So you need that active sensor. And what are the source of errors when you're using a, an IR? There are many, many sources of errors. The first one is ambient light. IR sensors are very susceptible to or very sensible to ambient light. This means that if you have a big window and an external light comes from outside, this external light is going to change the readings of your sensors. The second item is a neighborhood IR, which means that as the other robots are emitting IR, it will affect the readings of the robot itself. So we need to be careful. 
If we are using IR sensors, again, the color of the surface is important. The reading that you get from a black surface is going to be different from a white surface because the reflection changes. Talking about re reflectiveness properties, the material's reflectiveness. There are some materials that absorb light, and there are other materials that reflect it easily. This is going to change the readings that you get in your IR. And, and to finish it, the, the power of the battery. If the battery is low, the readings again are not going to be accurate. So, something that I want to start you to notice here is that if we want to have a very accurate representation of the IR sensor in the simulations, we need to consider all of this and we need to simulate all of this and guess what even then it's not going to be accurate even then it's going to take way longer to simulate this than than running your experiments so yes we need to start thinking about all of these trade-offs and all these trade-offs and all these sources of error are going to create the reality gap. What about if we want to model a motor or a wheel? We need a rotational actuator. What are the sources of error? The friction. The robot it, it is going to move different from a very flat surface to a raw surface. If the wheels or the motors are damaged, one wheel might be faster than the other one, and it will make the road to move slightly towards that direction. I'm going to show this in the next couple of slides, how this affects the road forms. And it's the same with rocks and gears. It might change how one wheel, the speed of one wheel is different to the other one. Similar with worm gears and battery power. Battery power is obvious if the battery is low level, the wheels are going to be slower. So let's have a look at two cases from my own experience where I have seen the reality gap. And let's try to learn from these cases and how we can avoid this reality gap or how we can address this reality gap. In my PhD, I implemented an algorithm of task partition and in foraging. I'm going to talk this in a, in a different lecture. But basically, the robots have to search an environment for objects to collect to the nest. And that's it. The, the, the robots could exchange objects with each other in order to achieve this. But something that I notice is that the behaviors or the way the robots move is very different from one to the other. These are two different robots trying, again, I would like to emphasize, trying to move forward. But as you can see, both robots fail and they fail in a different way, which is Ah, more difficult. It makes the task, the reality gap, bigger. When the robot on the left drifts slightly to the right, whereas the robot on the right drifts way much to the left. And this is important, and I'm going to show you this way. This is just more examples. These are six completely different robots trying to move in a straight line. Each robot is, has a different way to move. For example, robot E is completely different than robot A. And if we want to model this in simulation, sorry, I'm getting all excited. If you want to simulate this, it's, it's going to be really hard because you need to simulate the behavior of robot A, the simulated behavior of robot E, simulate their noises. The noise is going to be different. It is going to take a long time, but still it's important to do it. 
y. This graph represents how much time each robot, each robot A, B, C, D, E, and F spend exploring, going to the nest, or going to the source. It doesn't matter, I'm not gonna get into details about these states. What it's important to notice is that the performance of each robot is very different. The performance of robot E is different from the performance of robot A. And can you imagine why? It's because the performance of robot A, E, sorry, has higher noise than the robot in A. And this affects the performance of the swarm as a whole. So yes, the reality, reality gap is a thing, and it was in my experiments, and it changes the results. Because what we were looking for is to the performance to be the same for all the robots, not to have different performance for each one of those robots. Again, I'm not going to get into details, I just want to show you how much the reality gap influenced the results. For example, the results on the left shows that there is a when there is no noise, the graph is linear without any problems. But as soon as you start simulating noise in your robots, the behavior changes. And this is because the robots start to obstructing to each other. A robot with high error is going to be, become more like an obstacle and it's going to contribute less to the swarm. For example, in the robot on the right shows that if you have a high number of error robots in your swarm, the collection of items is not good, that it's not shown in here. Case number two. It's in my current project, Evolutionary Robotics. Unfortunately, it's not Swarm Robotics, but still happens in Swarm Robotics. So, where is the reality gap? Reality gap is the difference between the results that you get in hardware with the results that you get in simulation. It has many, for many reasons it's appear because of noise, because you didn't simulate the specific things in, in your environment. But yeah, basically it's a difference if you want your simulator to be as accurate as possible to the real world, it's going to get really expensive. 
because you have to simulate all this noise in the wheels, all this noise in the in the sensors. You have to simulate these uh, tiles. They take time. And if it's too real, it's slow. So my advice is it's up to you. If you if for your research, if you're for any reason you're using your simulator, you don't require high fidelity, go for a low fidelity simulator. If you require high fidelity, try to go for a high fidelity. It highly depends on the application. Okay. We know that this reality gap exists, but how we can reduce it, how we can remove it, how we can deal with it. Well, there are many ways and I'm going to show you just a couple of them and you can find more in literature. Many people do research about this. So, but yeah, these are just a few. The first one, the, the easiest in quotation marks to do is to simulate the noise in the wheels and the sensors. But as I shown, this is hard in robotic swarms because the noise is going to change from one robot to, to the other. But yeah, if you want a quick solution, just simulate the noise. Increase the fidelity of the simulation. If you go for a better simulator that has a better physics engine, calibrate the simulation parameters. So for example, if the performance doesn't match with hardware, you change the parameters in simulation to make it more accurate. And the last one is a very interesting one. I'm not going to get into details because it, it will require another lecture. But what you can do is to generate as many behaviors as you want in simulation. And when you're deploying it in hardware, you just choose one. And if it doesn't work, you choose another one. If it doesn't work, you choose another one. So on and so on and so on. I'm going to show you in the next video. And the next video is about a very famous paper. It was published in Nature and it's robots that adapt like animals. I strongly suggest you to read it. It deals with the reality gap and how the robots can self recover if they have, if they are damaged.
Right. Okay. Uh, I just want to finish this talk with uh, very briefly talking about the way that most people develop their algorithms and how do they run them. And the first way is that most people, what they do when they want to test something is that they create a mathematical model about the experiment that they want to do. If the mathematical model works or exhibits what you want, then you test it in simulation. And if you get the results that you expect, you move on. If you don't, you change the mathematical model. If it works, you run your experiments in hardware. And if it doesn't work, you change them in simulation and so on and so on. So yeah, this is a classic approach to develop algorithms and to address with the reality gap. Okay, to finish. In the first third, we talk about why the robotic simulators is important. And we say that we want to run experiments in a short period of time, and we want to run many of them with high fidelity, if possible. I mentioned some of the most common simulators used for robotic swarms, which are Argos is one of the better ones, and Vira as well. And finally, we saw what the reality gap is, why is it important to always consider it, how we can address it, and how it can change our results. Here are some reading, some videos that I found interesting and that you are going to like, including the, the videos of the robots that adapt like animals. And yeah, that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.